your arse handed to you. It's what will most likely happen near this accursed pond. The various warning signs set up around the pond should have been the first blood red flag for you. Though I'm sure that you, like myself, ignored many of them. The pond's located right here, in the center of the commons, and as we'll soon see, many know of its dangers. Perhaps you were not observant enough of the signs and wandered in. Or you just thought, fuck it, at least it's not a goose. How wrong we all were. There are many stories here, but let's get the big bastard over and done with first of all. Walking down towards the pond, the area is quite idyllic. Lovely trees, some sort of alive grass, and a pond that doesn't look a complete state, unlike many that we've come across in our journey. Well, time to have a quick gander around to make sure there are no enemy- Hmm, 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 hmm. Ah, uh, nope, a bit less of that, don't like that thing, one bit, no sir. So, a big super mutant called Swan is solid snaking it up in the water, at one with his surroundings, ready to murder the Christ out of us. He is, of course, a super mutant behemoth, which we will get to soon. To actually kill him, well, that is another story. I personally recommend a mixture of prayer, luck, faith, divine intervention, and drugs. It's a combination that will, in all likelihood, get you out of just about any and all situations in life. But if you really want to win, mind the shit out of the path he will take towards you. Try to cripple him, watch for his shitty boulders, and aim for his head. He'll be just dandy. He, you know, probably. Providing you don't die. Well, now that we have intruded in his home, and murdered him after we first shot him for no reason, it's time to examine his corpse. He is a behemoth. The increased muscle mass and height from your average super mutant marks him out as such. He wears the basic rags most behemoths wear, and then some. He wears pieces of one of the swan paddle boats from the lake. This increases his defense, unfortunately, making him slightly sturdier than your average behemoth. Several skulls adorn his arms and back, most likely from his numerous victims, the remains and stories of which we'll soon look at. He has a good amount of loot on him, including boat fragments that are an excellent source of fiberglass. However, the real prize is the Furious Power Fist. It has a pretty cool design and does pretty decent damage, uh, though it's unclear whether Swan was the one who constructed it or not. He also has a massive anchor that we can't use, but I want to. And I have no idea where in the hell he got it from. It wouldn't have been in the pond, so perhaps he went further afield and got it from one of the ships. Uh, either way, it will dome your head in, so, you, you know, don't get hit by it. Now for the story of the area, the first part of which will come from the corpse of this man here, Mikio. On his body, you can find the torn letter. Now, I assume it's addressed to Mikio. He seems to be intent on going somewhere, but he's warned to stay in Diamond City. They tell him that if he has to go, avoid the commons at all cost. Now, this corpse is probably the first victim you'll come across, and the first warning. You know, bar all the signs surrounding the place. The pond itself is quite a nice area, though note that, after we kill Swan, the water seems a little bit dirtier, doesn't it? More leaves, maybe? The pond itself is also part of the Freedom Trail, the clue for which can be found near this fountain, along with Protectron that you can activate and get some information about the pond. The writing is also visible at night. A word of the wise, however, there seems to be a period of time of at least a few hours at night in which Swan roams the place. It might explain why Mikhail, who presumably knew what lurked here, was caught out. Swan was on the prowl. The next place of interest is in relation to the raiders that surround the commons. A dead one can be found here, with the remains of several more scattered around the place. It seems they tried to make a last stand of sorts, possibly at night, if the lantern is anything to go on, using this gazebo as cover. A note from them can be found on one of the barrels of waste. It seems to be the advice a raider gave the group that came here. Though, as we can see, it, it didn't really work out. The various raider camps around the commons clearly know about Swan. They're actually most likely the ones who put up the signs. Some can even be heard yelling, I'll let Swan deal with you, if you try and flee through the commons while fighting them. The stead group may have been the remains of an attempt by the raiders to get rid of Swan, so that they could move through the commons more safely. Our next piece of the story comes near this glorious statue near the pond and shack in the form of a hollow tape clasped in the hands of half a skeleton. The tape is entitled, Fugitive's Hollow Tape.
Lost them? Yeah, we made it, Molly. We made it. <sighs> Why'd they let us go? No, no. Come on. Let's keep moving. Wait. The common. You've heard about the common. Oh, God. Mar, look out! Well, it's clear that did not end well for them by any means. So two raider fugitives, Marl and some guy, escaped into the commons. They felt like they were let go, and it's most likely because the pursuing raiders realized where they were going before these two did. They paid for that realization dearly and were killed by Swan. Or at least one of them was. Maybe they would have realized where they were sooner if they hadn't wasted so much time recording a hollow tip for whatever reason. Also, if you listen closely, the roar as Swan emerged was him saying his name, Swan. This must be how all the raiders came to know him by name, though how he got his name, we'll see that soon enough. Kath, this dead woman by this tree, provides the next note on this pond, in the form of the torn note. It is addressed to Kath by someone telling her that an aged called Davies tried to kill Swan, and he got his head torn off in the process. Kath seems to be attempting to kill him in a dur, and someone, most likely one of the raiders, is trying to talk her out of it showing one of the rare, softer sides uh, to the group that we rarely see. She may have been part of the group in the gazebo, though if that were the case, it would be odd that they are all skeletons and she looks relatively fresh, suggesting that she died more recently. So, on the whole, the raiders were clearly heavily involved with this area, setting up their bases in and around it, most likely because it offered easy access to other streets in Boston. This whole area would have made an excellent strategic location, if not for Swan and they clearly made more than one attempt to try and get rid of him. The various holes in the fences around the pond are most likely the remains of these battles, or the rare times when Swan actually chose to leave his pond, which based on the anger, he must have done so on more than one occasion. Now we can get onto the story of Swan himself, but first we need a little bit of background info on the commons, and the pond that he came to know as his home. This is found inside the last remaining boat, with the one he cannibalized for armor lying off to the side. A hollow tape is found that it seeks, and it's from the groundskeeper of the pond. It is entitled, Groundskeeper's Log. Seriously, this is getting freaking ridiculous. Merchant the Common and Public Garden was a jagged enough pill to swallow, but I went along with it. What, I'm gonna fight the developers? But how much smaller can they really make the swan pond? We get boats crashing into each other every day. It's like a glorified puddle. But what do I know, right? I'm just the groundskeeper of the world's smallest grounds. Might as well stay home from now on. My garden's bigger than this. At least I get to eat the peppers and cucumbers. Not watch tourists cry in disappointment. So the commons and the garden were originally separate, but were merged into the one area, the Swan Pond. Then, however, they wanted to make it even smaller, so much so that even the small amount of boats there crashed into each other. He calls it a glorified puddle, and he's not wrong. It's barely thigh deep, and Swan literally trailed the ground while he was in it, showing how small it was. It appears to be based on the duck pond that's located in the Boston Public Gardens in real life. Well, now that we've gotten the backstory out of the way, along with the stories of the other people who met their ends here, it's time to take a look at Swan's story. We can take a look at what once may have been his home, where we can find his notes that detail the degradation of his mind. The first note is entitled Experiment Log J32, Day 1. His full name is Edgar Swan. He stole cigarettes from somewhere and, as punishment, had to sit inside and write for a month. Seems odd, but nothing is out of the ordinary just yet. Day 6 is when he notices something is wrong. They're testing him more and more and every part of him aches. This is clearly related to his transformation. And who did this becomes clear in the next one. The next one is found next to this bench and it was written 8 days after the previous one. The writing, in general, seems more advanced than before, and as we read, it becomes clear why. He was injected with a strain of FEV to improve his neural efficiency, though at the same time, it also tripled his muscle mass. So far, there weren't any adverse effects, and he wants to be part of the research team and assist in his own experiment. Now, given that the group responsible for super mutants in the Commonwealth was the Institute, he was clearly an employee of theirs, and is being made to take part in this experiment as punishment. 
Day 21 is the last one, and the seizures have begun. He must have been let out at some point as they ordered him back to the labs. His viral strain is unstable and after a peak, his mind began to deteriorate. He knows what will happen to him, and fears the Institute will dispose of him. One final note can be found in his bed, entitled Swan's Note. It simply says, you are Swan. It appears this note was written while he was actually here, as the experiment would not have taken place in a shack. He probably took them with him after he escaped. He took shelter here for a while. Most likely he was the one who drank the beers and slept in the mattress, but it did not last. This note seems to be just before his mind snapped completely, and he became nothing but a beast, with nothing but a name to scream. Swan's Pond, and Swan, a former Institute employee, he was punished pretty harshly to be honest, uh, for stealing cigarettes. They injected him with an unstable strain of FEV that was meant to increase cognitive abilities. At first, it worked fine, improving his mind and his body. Eventually, however, the seizure occurred and his mind began to degrade. He seems to have escaped, taking his diary with him and took shelter here. Perhaps his mind made an association of sorts with Swan's Pond, like his name, his pond. Eventually, he got too big for his shack and spent the days floating around the pond. Readers came to know the area, putting up various warning signs. Others seemed to know of Swan as well. Don't go into the commons if you want to live. A pair of fugitives. Mikhail, trying to make his way through the commons. Kath, taking up a dur. A group of raiders who made a last stand. All people who came here, either looking for Swan or trying to pass through the commons. All of them died by his hand. If you bring Codsworth here, he comments in the pond, suggesting the sole survivor came here with their family, and that they may have been here when the changes the groundkeeper discussed occurred. It must have been a nice place for a day out back then, and in some ways, it still was. It was a peaceful area, in a way, devoid of outside conflict. It kept the raiders in check and prevented them from obtaining a fortifiable foothold in the commons. The pond itself was pretty nice. However, on coming back later, it becomes filled with mud and leaves, dirty and sad, as if mourning the loss of its watcher and protector, Swan. The sad story behind a vicious beast and the pond it watched over. I hoped you liked this look at all of it. If you did like it, give the video a like, and if you want regular updates, subscribe. Any suggestions for lore or future updates should be left in the comments below, or better yet, go on to my subreddit so we can discuss them in more detail. It's linked in the description. If you wish to, you can support me on Patreon, which is also linked in the description. Go have a gander at the rewards. Follow me on Twitter or Facebook to get regular updates or have a wee chat. Any businesses you wish to discuss, email me at earthapple.business at gmail.com and I will get back to you as soon as possible. I hope you enjoyed the episode and I hope to see you in the next one. And until then, goodbye.